The mole had long wanted to make the acquaintance of the badger. He seemed, by all accounts, to be such an important personage, and, though rarely visible, to make his unseen influence felt by everybody about the place. But whenever the mole mentioned his wish to the water rat, he always found himself put off. It's all right, the rat would say. Badger will turn up some day or other. He's always turning up. And then I'll introduce you. The best of fellows. But uh, you must not only take him as you find him, but when you find him. Couldn't you ask him here for dinner or something? Said the mole. He wouldn't come, replied the rat simply. Badger hates society and invitations and dinner and all that sort of thing. Well then, supposing we go and call on him, suggested the mole. Oh, I'm sure he wouldn't like that at all, said the rat, quite alarmed. He's so very shy, he'd sure to be offended. I've never even ventured to call him at his own home myself, though I know him so well. Besides, we can't. It's quite out of the question, because he lives in the very middle of the wild wood. Well, supposing he does, said the mole. You told me the wild wood was all right, you know. Oh, I know, I know. So it is, replied the rat evasively. But I think we won't go there just now. Not just yet. It's a long way, and he wouldn't be at home at this time of year anyhow. And he'll be coming along some day, if you'll wait quietly. The mole had to be content with this, but the badger never came along, and every day brought its amusements. And it was not till summer was long over, and cold and frost and miry ways kept them much indoors, and the swollen river raced past outside their windows with a speed that mocked at boating of any sort or kind, that he found his thoughts dwelling again with much persistence on the solitary grey badger who lived his own life by himself in his hole in the middle of the wild wood. In the winter time, the rat slept a great deal, retiring early and rising late. During his short day, he sometimes scribbled poetry or did other small domestic jobs about the house, and of course there were always animals dropping in for a chat, and consequently there was a good deal of storytelling and comparing notes on the past summer and all its doings. Such a rich chapter it had been when one came to look back on it all with illustrations so numerous and so very highly coloured. The pageant of the river bank had marched steadily along, unfolding itself in scene pictures that succeeded each other in stately procession. Purple loose strife arrived early, shaking luxuriant, tangled locks along the edge of the mirror, whence its own face laughed back at it. Willow herb, tender and wistful, like a pink sunset cloud, was not slow to follow. Comfrey, the purple hand in hand with the white, crept forth to take its place in the line, and at last, one morning, the diffident and delaying dog rose, stepped delicately on the stage, and one knew, as if string music had announced it in stately chords that strayed into a gavotte, that June at last was here. One member of the company was still awaited, the shepherd boy, for the nymphs to woo, the knight for whom the ladies waited at the window, the prince that was to kiss the sleeping summer back to life and love. But when meadowsweet, debonair and odorous and amber jerkin moved graciously to his place in the group, then the play was ready to begin. And what a play it had been, drowsy animals snug in their holes while wind and rain were battering at their doors, recalled still keen mornings, an hour before sunrise, when the white mist, as yet undispersed, clung closely along the surface of the water. Then the shock of the early plunge, the scamper along the bank, and the radiant transformation of earth, air, and water, when suddenly the sun was with them again, and grey was gold, and colour was born and sprang out of the earth once more, they recalled the languorous siesta of hot midday, deep in green undergrowth, the sun striking through in tiny golden shafts and spots, the boating and bathing of the afternoon, the rambles along dusty lanes and through yellow cornfields, and the long, cool evening at last, 
when so many threads were gathered up, so many friendships rounded, and so many adventures planned for the morrow. There was plenty to talk about on those short winter days when the animals found themselves round the fire. Still, the mole had a good deal of spare time on his hands, and so one afternoon, when the rat in his armchair before the blaze was alternately dozing and trying over rhymes that wouldn't fit, he formed the resolution to go out by himself and explore the wildwood, and perhaps strike up an acquaintance with Mr. Badger. It was a cold, still afternoon with a hard, steely sky overhead when he slipped out of the warm parlour into the open air. The country lay bare and entirely leafless around him, and he thought that he had never seen so far and so intimately into the insides of things as on that winter day when nature was deep in her annual slumber and seemed to have kicked the clothes off. Copses, dells, quarries, and all hidden places, which had been mysterious mines for exploration in leafy summer, now exposed themselves and their secrets pathetically, and seemed to ask him to overlook their shabby poverty for a while, till they could riot in rich masquerade as before, and trick and entice him with the old deceptions. It was pitiful in a way, and yet cheering, even exhilarating. He was glad that he liked the country undecorated, hard and stripped of its finery. He had got down to the bare bones of it, and they were fine and strong and simple. He did not want the warm clover and the play of seeding grasses, the screens of quickset, the billowy drapery of beech and elm seemed best away, and with great cheerfulness of spirit, he pushed on towards the wildwood, which lay before him, low and threatening, like a black reef in some still southern sea. There was nothing to alarm him at first entry. Twigs crackled under his feet, logs tripped him, funguses on stumps resembled caricatures, and startled him for the moment by their likeness to something familiar and far away. But that was all fun and exciting. It led him on, and he penetrated to where the light was less, and trees crouched nearer and nearer, and holes made ugly mouths at him on either side. Everything was very still now. The dusk advanced on him steadily, rapidly, gathering in behind and before, and the light seemed to be draining away like flood water. Then the faces began. It was over his shoulder, and indistinctly, that he first thought he saw a face, a little evil wedge-shaped face looking out at him from a hole. When he turned and confronted it, the thing had vanished. He quickened his pace, telling himself cheerfully not to begin imagining things, or there would be simply no end to it. He passed another hole, and another, and another, and then, yes, no, yes, certainly a little narrow face with hard eyes had flashed up for an instant from a hole and was gone. He hesitated, braced himself up for an effort and strode on. Then suddenly, and as if it had been so all the time, every hole, far and near, and there were hundreds of them, seemed to possess its face, coming and going rapidly, all fixing on him glances of malice and hatred, all hard-eyed and evil and sharp. If he could only get away from the holes in the banks, he thought, there would be no more faces. He swung off the path and plunged into the untrodden places of the wood. Then the whistling began. Very faint and shrill it was, and far behind him when first he heard it, but somehow it made him hurry forward. Then, still very faint and shrill, it sounded far ahead of him and made him hesitate and want to go back. As he halted in indecision, it broke out on either side and seemed to be caught up and passed on throughout the whole length of the wood to its farthest limit. They were up and alert and ready, evidently, whoever they were, and he, he was alone and unarmed and far from any help, and the night was closing in. Then the pattering began. He thought it was only falling leaves at first. So slight and delicate was the sound of it. Then, as it grew, it took a regular rhythm, and he knew it for nothing else but the pat, pat, pat of little feet still a very long way off. Was it in front or behind? 
It seemed to be first one, and then the other, then both. It grew and it multiplied, till from every quarter as he listened anxiously, leaning this way and that, it seemed to be closing in on him. As he stood still to hearken, a rabbit came running hard towards him through the trees. He waited, expecting it to slacken pace or to swerve from him into a different course. Instead, the animal almost brushed him as it dashed past, his face set and hard, his eyes staring. Get out of this, you fool. Get out. The mole heard him mutter as he swung round a stump and disappeared down a friendly burrow. The pattering increased till it sounded like sudden hail on the dry leaf carpet spread around him. The whole wood seemed running now, running hard, hunting, chasing, closing in round something or somebody. In panic, he began to run too, aimlessly, he knew not whither. He ran up against things, he fell over things and into things, he darted under things and dodged round things. At last, he took refuge in the deep, dark hollow of an old beech tree which offered shelter, concealment, perhaps even safety, but who could tell? Anyhow, he was too tired to run any further, and could only snuggle down into the dry leaves which had drifted into the hollow, and hope he was safe for a time. And as he lay there, panting and trembling, and listening to the whistlings and the patterings outside, he knew it at last, in all its fullness, that dread thing which other little dwellers in field and hedgerow had encountered here, and known as their darkest moment, that thing which the rat had vainly tried to shield him from, the terror of the wild wood. Meantime, the rat, warm and comfortable, dozed by his fireside. His paper of half-finished verses slipped from his knee, his head fell back, his mouth opened, and he wandered by the verdant banks of dream rivers. Then a coal slipped, the fire crackled and sent up a spurt of flame, and he woke with a start. Remembering what he had been engaged upon, he reached down to the floor for his verses, pored over them for a minute, and then looked round for the mole to ask him if he knew a good rhyme for something or other. But the mole was not there. He listened for a time. The house seemed very quiet. Then he called, Molly, several times, and receiving no answer, got up and went out into the hall. The mole's cap was missing from its accustomed peg. His galoshes, which always lay by the umbrella stand, were also gone. The rat left the house and carefully examined the muddy surface of the ground outside, hoping to find the mole's tracks. There they were, sure enough. The galoshes were new, just bought for the winter, and the pimples on their soles were fresh and sharp. He could see the imprints of them in the mud, running along, straight and purposeful, leading direct to the wild wood. The rat looked very grave, and stood in deep thought for a minute or two. Then he re-entered the house, strapped a belt round his waist, shoved a brace of pistols into it, took up a stout cudgel that stood in a corner of the hall and set off for the wild wood at a smart pace. It was already getting towards dusk when he reached the first fringe of trees and plunged without hesitation into the wood, looking anxiously on either side for any sign of his friend. Here and there, wicked little faces popped out of holes, but vanished immediately at sight of the valorous animal, his pistols, and the great, ugly cudgel in his grasp, and the whistling and pattering which he had heard quite plainly on his first entry died away and ceased, and all was very still. He made his way manfully through the length of the wood to its furthest edge, then, forsaking all paths, he set himself to traverse it, laboriously working over the whole ground, and all the time calling out cheerfully, Molly, 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 where are you? It's me, it's Old Rat. He had patiently hunted through the wood for an hour or more, when at last, to his joy, he heard a little answering cry. Guiding himself by the sound, he made his way through the gathering darkness to the foot of an old beech tree with a hole in it, and from out of the hole came a feeble voice saying, Ratty, is that really you? 
The rat crept into the hollow, and there he found the mole, exhausted and still trembling. Oh, rat, he cried, I've been so frightened you can't think. Oh, I quite understand, said the rat soothingly. You shouldn't really have gone and done it, mole. I did my best to keep you from it. We river bankers, we hardly ever come here by ourselves. If we have to come, we come in couples at least. Then we're generally all right. Besides, there are a hundred things one has to know, which we understand all about, and you don't as yet. I mean, passwords and signs and sayings, which have power and effect, and plants you carry in your pocket, and verses you repeat, and dodges and tricks you practice. All simple enough when you know them, but they've got to be known if you're small, or you'll find yourself in trouble. Of course, if you were badger or otter, it would be quite another matter. Surely the brave Mr. Toad wouldn't mind coming here by himself, would he? Inquired the mole. Old Toad, said the rat, laughing heartily. He wouldn't show his face here alone. Not for a whole hatful of golden guineas, Toad wouldn't. The mole was greatly cheered by the sound of the rat's careless laughter, as well as by the sight of his stick and his gleaming pistols, and he stopped shivering and began to feel bolder and more himself again. Now then, said the rat presently, we really must pull ourselves together and make a start for home while there's still a little light left. It will never do to spend the night here, you understand? Too cold, for one thing. Dear ratty, said the poor mole, I'm dreadfully sorry, but I'm simply dead beat, and that's a solid fact. You must let me rest here a while longer and get my strength back, if I'm to get home at all. Oh, all right, said the good-natured rat. Rest away. It's pretty nearly pitch dark now anyhow, and uh, there ought to be a bit of a moon later. So the mole got well into the dry leaves and stretched himself out, and presently dropped off into sleep, though of a broken and troubled sort while the rat covered himself up too, as best he might, for warmth, and lay patiently waiting, with a pistol in his paw. When at last the mole woke up, much refreshed and in his usual spirits, the rat said, Now then, I'll just take a look outside and see if everything's quiet, and then we really must be off. He went to the entrance of their retreat and put his head out. Then the mole heard him saying quietly to himself, Hello, hello, here is a go. What's up, Ratty? asked the mole. Snow is up, replied the rat briefly. Or rather, down. It's snowing hard. The mole came and crouched beside him, and looking out, saw the wood that had been so dreadful to him in quite a changed aspect. Holes, hollows, pools, pitfalls, and other black menaces to the wayfarer were vanishing fast, and a gleaming carpet of fairy was springing up everywhere that looked too delicate to be trodden upon by rough feet. A fine powder filled the air and caressed the cheek with a tingle in its touch, and the black boles of the trees showed up in a light that seemed to come from below. Well, well... It can't be helped, said the rat, after pondering. We must make a start and take our chance, I suppose. The worst of it is, I don't exactly know where we are, and now the snow makes everything look so very different. It did indeed. The mole would not have known that it was the same wood. However, they set out bravely and took the line that seemed most promising, holding on to each other and pretending with invincible cheerfulness that they recognized an old friend in every fresh tree that grimly and silently greeted them, or saw openings, gaps, or paths with a familiar turn in them, in the monotony of white space and black tree trunks that refused to vary. An hour or two later, they had lost all count of time, they pulled up, dispirited, weary, and hopelessly at sea, and sat down on a fallen tree trunk to recover their breath and consider what was to be done. They were aching with fatigue and bruised with tumbles. They had fallen into several holes and got wet through. The snow was getting so deep that they could hardly drag their little legs through it, and the trees were thicker and more like each other than ever. 
there seemed to be no end to this wood, and no beginning, and no difference in it, and worst of all, no way out. We can't sit here very long, said the rat. We shall have to make another push for it, and do something or other. The cold is too awful for anything, and the snow will soon be too deep for us to wade through. He peered about him and considered. Look here, he went on. This is what occurs to me. There's a sort of dell down here in front of us, where the ground seems all hilly and humpy and hummocky. We'll make our way down into that and try to find some sort of shelter, a cave or a hole with a dry floor to it, out of the snow and the wind. And there we'll have a good rest before we try again, for we're both of us pretty dead beat. Besides, the snow may leave off, or something may turn up. So, once more, they got on their feet and struggled down into the dell, where they hunted about for a cave or some corner that was dry and a protection from the keen wind and the whirling snow. They were investigating one of the hummocky bits the rat had spoken of, when suddenly the mole tripped up and fell forward on his face with a squeal. Oh, my leg! he cried. Oh, my poor shin! And he sat up on the snow and nursed his leg in both his front paws. Poor old mole, said the rat kindly. You don't seem to be having much luck today, do you? Let's have a look at that leg. Yes, he went on, going down on his knees to look. You've cut your shin, sure enough. Wait till I get my handkerchief and I'll tie it up for you. I must have tripped over a hidden branch or a stump, said the mole miserably. Oh my, oh my. It's a very clean cut, said the rat, examining it again attentively. That was never done by a branch or a stump. Looks as if it was made by a sharp edge of something in metal. Funny. He pondered a while and examined the humps and slopes that surrounded them. Well, never mind what done it, said the mole, forgetting his grammar in his pain. It hurts just the same, whatever done it. But the rat, after carefully tying up the leg with his handkerchief, had left him and was busy scraping in the snow. He scratched and shoveled and explored, all four legs working busily, while the mole waited impatiently, remarking at intervals, Oh, come on, rat! Suddenly, the rat cried, Hooray! And then, Hooray! 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 and fell to executing a feeble jig in the snow. What have you found, Ratty? asked the mole, still nursing his leg. Come and see, said the delighted rat as he jigged on. The mole hobbled up to the spot and had a good look. Well, he said at last, slowly. I see it right enough, seen the same sort of thing before, lots of times. Familiar object, I call it. A door scraper. Well, what of it? Why dance jigs around a door scraper? But don't you see what it means? You, you dull-witted animal, cried the rat impatiently. Of course I see what it means, replied the mole. It simply means that some very careless and forgetful person has left his door scraper lying about in the middle of the wild wood, just where it's sure to trip everybody up. Very thoughtless of him, I call it. When I get home, I shall go and complain about it to, to somebody or other. See if I don't. Oh dear, oh dear, cried the rat, in despair at his obtuseness. Here, stop arguing and come and scrape. And he set to work again and made the snow fly in all directions around him. After some further toil, his efforts were rewarded and a very shabby doormat lay exposed to view. There, what did I tell you? exclaimed the rat in great triumph. Absolutely nothing whatever, replied the mole with perfect truthfulness. Well now, he went on, you seem to have found another piece of domestic litter, done for and thrown away. And I suppose you're perfectly happy. Better go ahead and dance your jig round that if you've got to, and get it over. And then perhaps we can go on and not waste any more time over rubbish heaps. Can we eat a doormat? Or sleep under a doormat? Or sit on a doormat? And sledge home over the snow on it? You exasperating rodent! Do you mean to say, cried the excited rat, that this doormat doesn't tell you anything? Really, rat, said the mole quite pettishly. I think we'd had quite enough of this folly. 
Who ever heard of a doormat telling anyone anything? They simply don't do it. They are not that sort at all. Doormats know their place. Now look here, you, you thick-headed beast, replied the rat, really angry. This must stop. Not another word, but scrape, scrape, and scratch, and dig and hunt round, especially on the sides of the hummocks. If you want to sleep dry and warm tonight, for this is our last chance. The rat attacked a snowbank beside them with ardor, probing with his cudgel everywhere, and then digging with fury. And the mole scraped busily too, more to oblige the rat than for any other reason, for his opinion was that his friend was getting lightheaded. Some ten minutes hard work, and the point of the rat's cudgel struck something that sounded hollow. He worked till he could get a paw through and feel, then called the mole to come and help him. Hard at it went the two animals, till at last, the result of their labours stood full in view of the astonished and hitherto incredulous mole. In the side of what had seemed to be a snowbank stood a solid-looking little door, painted a dark green. An iron bell pull hung by the side, and below it, on a small brass plate, neatly engraved in square capital letters, they could read by the aid of moonlight, Mr. Badger. The mole fell backwards on the snow from sheer surprise and delight. Rat, he cried in penitence. You're a wonder, a real wonder, that's what you are. I see it all now. You argued it out step by step in that wise head of yours from the very moment I fell and cut my shin and you looked at the cut and at once your majestic mind said to itself, door scraper. And then you turned to and found the very door scraper that done it. Did you stop there? No. Some people would have been quite satisfied, but not you. Your intellect went on working. Let me only just find a doormat, says you to yourself, and my theory is proved. And of course, you found your doormat. You're so clever. I believe you could find anything you liked. Now, says you, that door exists, as plain as if I saw it. There's nothing else remains to be done but to find it. Well, I've read about that sort of thing in books, but I've never come across it before in real life. You ought to go where you'll be properly appreciated. You're simply wasted here among us fellows. If I only had your head, Ratty. But as you haven't, interrupted the rat rather unkindly, I suppose you're going to sit on the snow all night and talk? Get up at once and hang on to that bell pole you see there. And ring hard, as hard as you can, while I hammer. While the rat attacked the door with his stick, the mole sprang up at the bell pool, clutched it and swung there, both feet well off the ground. And from quite a long way off, they could faintly hear a deep-toned bell respond. Chapter 4. Mr. Badger They waited patiently for what seemed a very long time, stamping in the snow to keep their feet warm, at last, they heard the sound of slow, shuffling footsteps approaching the door from the inside. It seemed, as the mole remarked to the rat, like someone walking in carpet slippers that were too large for him and down at heel, which was intelligent of mole because that was exactly what it was. There was the noise of a bolt shot back and the door opened a few inches, enough to show a long snout and a pair of sleepy, blinking eyes. Now, the very next time this happens, said a gruff and suspicious voice, I shall be exceedingly angry. Who is it this time, disturbing people on such a night? Speak up. Oh, Badger, cried the Rat. Let us in, please. It's me, Rat, and my friend Mole, and we've lost our way in the snow. What, Ratty, my dear little man? exclaimed the badger in quite a different voice. Come along in, both of you, at once. Why, you must be perished. Well, I never. Lost in the snow, and in the wild wood too, and at this time of night. But come in with you. The two animals tumbled over each other in their eagerness to get inside, and heard the door shut behind them with great joy and relief. The badger, who wore a long dressing gown, and whose slippers were indeed very down at heel, carried a flat candlestick in his paw and had probably been on his way to bed when their summons sounded. He looked kindly down on them and patted both their heads. 
This is not the sort of night for small animals to be out, he said paternally. I'm afraid you've been up to some of your pranks again, Ratty. But come along, come into the kitchen. There's a first-rate fire there, and supper and everything. He shuffled on in front of them, carrying the light, and they followed him, nudging each other in an anticipating sort of way, down a long, gloomy, and, to tell the truth, decidedly shabby passage, into a sort of a central hall, out of which they could dimly see other long tunnel-like passages branching, passages mysterious and without apparent end. But there were doors in the hall as well, stout, oaken, comfortable-looking doors. One of these the badger flung open, and at once they found themselves in all the glow and warmth of a large, fire-lit kitchen. The floor was well-worn red brick, and on the wide hearth burnt a fire of logs, between two attractive chimney corners tucked away in the wall, well out of any suspicion of draught. A couple of high-backed settles, facing each other on either side of the fire, gave further sitting accommodations for the sociably disposed. In the middle of the room stood a long table of plain boards placed on trestles, with benches down each side. At one end of it, where an armchair stood pushed back, were spread the remains of the badger's plain but ample supper. Rows of spotless plates winked from the shelves of the dresser at the far end of the room, and from the rafters overhead hung hams, bundles of dried herbs, nets of onions, and baskets of eggs. It seemed a place where heroes could fitly feast after victory, where weary harvesters could line up in scores along the table and keep their harvest home with mirth and song or where two or three friends of simple tastes could sit about as they pleased and eat and smoke and talk in comfort and contentment. The ruddy brick floor smiled up at the smoky ceiling. The oaken settles, shiny with long wear, exchanged cheerful glances with each other. Plates on the dresser grinned at pots on the shelf, and the merry firelight flickered and played over everything without distinction. The kindly badger thrust them down on a settle to toast themselves at the fire and bade them remove their wet coats and boots. Then he fetched them dressing gowns and slippers and himself bathed the mole's shin with warm water and mended the cut with sticking plaster till the whole thing was just as good as new, if not better. In the embracing light and warmth, warm and dry at last, with weary legs propped up in front of them, and a suggestive clink of plates being arranged on the table behind, it seemed to the storm-driven animals, now in safe anchorage, that the cold and trackless wild wood just left outside was miles and miles away, and all that they had suffered in it a half-forgotten dream. When at last they were thoroughly toasted, the badger summoned them to the table, where he had been busy laying a repast. They had felt pretty hungry before, but when they actually saw at last the supper that was spread for them, really it seemed only a question of what they should attack first, where all was so attractive, and whether the other things would obligingly wait for them till they had time to give them attention conversation was impossible for a long time, and when it was slowly resumed, it was that regrettable sort of conversation that results from talking with your mouth full. The badger did not mind that sort of thing at all, nor did he take any notice of elbows on the table or everybody speaking at once. As he did not go into society himself, he had got an idea that these things belonged to the things that didn't really matter. We know, of course, that he was wrong, and took too narrow a view, because they do matter very much, though it would take too long to explain why. He sat in his armchair at the head of the table and nodded gravely at intervals as the animals told their story, and he did not seem surprised or shocked at anything, and he never said, I told you so, or just what I always said, or remarked that they ought to have done so and so, or ought not to have done something else. The mole began to feel very friendly towards him. 
When supper was really finished at last, and each animal felt that his skin was now as tight as was decently safe, and that by this time he didn't care a hang for anybody or anything, they gathered round the glowing embers of the great wood fire and thought how jolly it was to be sitting up so late and so independent and so full. And after they had chatted for a time about things in general, the badger said heartily, Now then, tell us the news from your part of the world. How's old Toad going on? Oh, from bad to worse, said the rat gravely, while the mole, cocked up on a settle and basking in the firelight, his heels higher than his head, tried to look properly mournful. Another smash-up only last week, and a bad one. You see, he will insist on driving himself, and he's hopelessly incapable. If he'd only employ a decent, steady, well-trained animal, pay him good wages, and leave everything to him, he'd get on all right. But no, he's convinced he's a heaven-born driver, and nobody can teach him anything, and all the rest follows. How many has he had? inquired the badger gloomily. Smashes or machines? asked the rat. Oh, well, after all, it's the same thing with Toad. This is the seventh. As for the others, you know that coach house of his? Well, it's piled up, literally piled up to the roof, with fragments of motor cars, none of them bigger than your hat. That accounts for the other six, so far as they can be accounted for. He's been in hospital three times, put in the mole, and as for the fines he's had to pay, it's simply awful to think of. Yes, and that's part of the trouble, continued the rat. Toad's rich, we all know, but he's not a millionaire, and he's a hopelessly bad driver, and quite regardless of law and order, killed or ruined. It's got to be one of the two things sooner or later. Badger, we're his friends. Oughtn't we to do something? The badger went through a bit of hard thinking. Now look here, he said at last, rather severely. Of course you know I can't do anything now. His two friends assented, quite understanding his point. No animal, according to the rules of animal etiquette, is ever expected to do anything strenuous or heroic or even moderately active during the off-season of winter. All are sleepy, some actually asleep. All are weather-bound, more or less, and all are resting from arduous days and nights, during which every muscle in them has been severely tested, and every energy kept at full stretch. Very well, then, continued the badger. But when once the year has really turned, and the nights are shorter, and halfway through then one rouses, and feels fidgety, and wanting to be up and doing by sunrise, if not before, you know. Both animals nodded gravely. They knew. Well, then went on the badger. We, that is, you and me and our friend the mole here, we'll take Toad seriously in hand. We'll stand no nonsense whatever. We'll bring him back to reason, by force if need be. We'll make him be a sensible Toad. We'll... You're a sleep rat. Uh, not me, said the rat, waking up with a jerk. He's been asleep two or three times since supper, said the mole, laughing. He himself was feeling quite wakeful and even lively, though he didn't know why. The reason was, of course, that he, being naturally an underground animal by birth and breeding, the situation of Badger's house exactly suited him and made him feel at home, while the rat, who slept every night in a bedroom, the windows of which opened on a breezy river, naturally felt the atmosphere still and oppressive. Well, it's time we were all in bed, said the badger, getting up and fetching flat candlesticks. Come along, you two, and I'll show you to your quarters, and take your time tomorrow morning, breakfast at any hour you please. He conducted the two animals to a long room that seemed half bedchamber and half loft. The badger's winter stores, which indeed were visible everywhere, took up half the room. Piles of apples, turnips and potatoes, baskets full of nuts and jars of honey. But the two little white beds on the remainder of the floor looked soft and inviting, and the linen on them, though coarse, was clean and smelt beautifully of lavender. And the mole and the water rat, shaking off their garments in some thirty seconds, tumbled in between the sheets in great joy and contentment. 
In accordance with the kindly badger's injunctions, the two tired animals came down to breakfast very late next morning and found a bright fire burning in the kitchen and two young hedgehogs sitting on a bench at the table, eating oatmeal porridge out of wooden bowls. The hedgehogs dropped their spoons, rose to their feet, and ducked their heads respectfully as the two entered. There, <laughs> sit down, sit down, said the rat pleasantly. And go on with your porridge. Where have you youngsters come from? Lost your way in the snow, I suppose? Yes, please, sir, said the elder of the two hedgehogs respectfully. Me and little Billy here, we was trying to find our way to school. Mother would have us go, was the weather ever so, and of course we lost ourselves, sir. And Billy, he got frightened and took and cried, being young and faint-hearted. And at last we happened up against Mr. Badger's back door and made so bold as to knock, sir. For Mr. Badger, he's a kind-hearted gentleman, as everyone knows. I understand, said the rat, cutting himself some rashes from a side of bacon, while the mole dropped some eggs into a saucepan. And what's the weather like outside? You needn't sir me quite so much, he added. Oh, terrible bad, sir. Terrible deep the snow is, said the hedgehog. No getting out for the likes of you gentlemen today. Where's Mr. Badger? inquired the mole as he warmed the coffee pot before the fire. The master's gone into his study, sir, replied the hedgehog. And he said as how he was going to be particular busy this morning, and on no account was he to be disturbed. This explanation, of course, was thoroughly understood by everyone present. The fact is, as already set forth, when you live a life of intense activity for six months in the year, and of comparative or actual somnolence for the other six, during the latter period you cannot be continually pleading sleepiness when there are people about or things to be done. The excuse gets monotonous. The animals well knew that Badger, having eaten a hearty breakfast, had retired to his study and settled himself in an armchair with his legs up on another and a red cotton handkerchief over his face, and was being busy in the usual way at this time of the year. The front door bell clanged loudly, and the rat, who was very greasy with buttered toast, sent Billy, the smaller hedgehog, to see who it might be. There was a sound of much stamping in the hall, and presently Billy returned in front of the otter, who threw himself on the rat with an embrace and a shout of affectionate greeting. Get off, spluttered the rat with his mouth full. Thought I should find you here all right, said the otter cheerfully. They were all in a great state of alarm along River Bank when I arrived this morning. Rat never been home all night. Nor Mole either. Something dreadful must have happened, they said. And the snow had covered up all your tracks, of course. But I knew that when people were in any fix, they mostly went to Badger, or else Badger got to know of it somehow. So I came straight off here, through the wild wood and the snow. My, it was fine coming through the snow as the red sun was rising and showing against the black tree trunks. As she went along in the stillness, every now and then masses of snow slid off the branches suddenly with a flop, making you jump and run for cover. Snow castles and snow caverns had sprung up out of nowhere in the night, and snow bridges, terraces, ramparts. I could have stayed and played with them for hours. Here and there great branches had been torn away by the sheer weight of the snow and robins perched and hopped on them in their perky, conceited way, just as if they had done it themselves. A ragged string of wild geese passed overhead, high on the grey sky, and a few rooks whirled over the trees, inspected and flapped off homewards with a disgusted expression. But I met no sensible being to ask the news of. About halfway across I came on a rabbit sitting on a stump, cleaning his silly face with his paws. He was a pretty scared animal when I crept up behind him and placed a heavy forepaw on his shoulder. I had to cuff his head once or twice to get any sense out of it at all. At last I managed to extract from him that Mole had been seen in the wild wood last night by one of them. It was the talk of the burrows, he said, 
how mole mr rat's particular friend was in a bad fix how he had lost his way and they were up and out hunting and were chivying him round and round then why didn't any of you do something i asked you may not be blessed with brains but there are hundreds and hundreds of you big stout fellows as fat as butter and your burrows running in all directions and you could have taken him in and made him safe and comfortable or tried to at all events what us he merely said do something us rabbits so i cuffed him again and left him there was nothing else to be done at any rate i had learned something and if i had had the luck to meet any of them i'd have learned something more or they would weren't you at all uh, nervous asked the mole some of yesterday's terror coming back to him at the mention of the wild wood nervous the otter showed a gleaming set of strong white teeth as he laughed i'd give him nerves if any of them tried anything on with me here mole fry me some slices of ham like the good little chap you are i'm frightfully hungry and i've got any amount to say to ratty here I haven't seen him for an age so the good-natured mole having cut some slices of ham set the hedgehogs to fry it and returned to his own breakfast while the otter and the rat their heads together eagerly talked river shop which is long shop and talk that is endless running on like the babbling river itself a plate of fried ham had just been cleared and sent back for more when the badger entered yawning and rubbing his eyes and greeted them all in his quiet simple way with kind inquiries for everyone it must be getting on for luncheon time he remarked to the otter better stop and have it with us you must be hungry this cold morning rather replied the otter winking at the mole the sight of these greedy young hedgehogs stuffing themselves with fried ham makes me feel positively famished the hedgehogs who were just beginning to feel hungry again after their porridge and after working so hard at their frying looked timidly up at mr badger but were too shy to say anything here you two youngsters be off home to your mother said the badger kindly i'll send someone with you to show you the way you won't want any dinner today i'll be bound he gave them sixpence apiece and a pat on the head and they went off with much respectful swinging of caps and touching of forelocks. Presently, they all sat down to luncheon together. The mole found himself placed next to Mr. Badger, and as the other two were still deep in river gossip from which nothing could divert them, he took the opportunity to tell Badger how comfortable and homelike it all felt to him. Once well underground, he said, you know exactly where you are, nothing can happen to you and nothing can get at you you're entirely your own master and you don't have to consult anybody or mind what they say things go on all the same overhead and you let them and don't bother about them when you want to up you go and there the things are waiting for you the badger simply beamed on him that's exactly what i say he replied there's no security or peace and tranquillity except underground and then if your ideas get larger and you want to expand why a dig and a scrape and there you are if you feel your house is a bit too big you stop up a hole or two and there you are again no builders no tradesmen no remarks passed on you by fellows looking over your wall and above all no weather look at rat now a couple of feet of flood water and he's got to move into hired lodgings uncomfortable inconveniently situated and horribly expensive take toad i say nothing against toad hall quite the best house in these parts as a house but supposing a fire breaks out where's toad supposing tiles are blown off or walls sink or crack or windows get broken where's toad supposing the rooms are draughty i hate a draught myself where's toad no up and out of doors is good enough to roam about and get one's living in but underground to come back to at last that's my idea of home the mole assented heartily, and the badger, in consequence, got very friendly with him. When lunch is over, he said, I'll take you all round this little place of mine. I can see you'll appreciate it. 
You understand what domestic architecture ought to be, you do. After luncheon, accordingly, when the other two had settled themselves into the chimney corner and had started a heated argument on the subject of eels, the badger lighted a lantern and bade the mole follow him. Crossing the hall, they passed down one of the principal tunnels, and the wavering light of the lantern gave glimpses on either side of rooms both large and small, some mere cupboards, others nearly as broad and imposing as Toad's dining hall. A narrow passage at right angles led them into another corridor, and here the same thing was repeated. The mole was staggered at the size, the extent, the ramifications of it all. At the length of the dim passages, the solid vaultings of the crammed store chambers, the masonry everywhere, the pillars, the arches, the pavements. How on earth, Badger, he said at last, did you ever find time and strength to do all this? It's astonishing. It would be astonishing indeed, said the Badger simply. If I had done it, but as a matter of fact, I did none of it. Only cleaned out the passages and chambers, as far as I had need of them. There's lots more of it all round about. I see you don't understand, and I must explain it to you. Well, very long ago, on the spot where the wildwood waves now, before ever it had planted itself and grown up to what it is now, there was a city, a city of people, you know. Here, where we are standing, they lived and walked and talked and slept and carried on their business. Here they stabled their horses and feasted. From here they rode out to fight or drove out to trade. They were a powerful people and rich and great builders. They built to last, for they thought their city would last for ever. But what has become of them all? asked the mole. Who can tell? said the badger. People come, they stay for a while, they flourish, they build, and they go. It is their way, but we remain. There were badgers here, I've been told, long before that same city ever came to be, and now there are badgers here again. We are an enduring lot, and we may move out for a time, but we wait, and are patient, and that we come. And so it will ever be. Well, and when they went at last, those people, said the mole. When they went, continued the badger, the strong winds and persistent rains took the matter in hand, patiently, ceaselessly, year after year. Perhaps we badgers, too, in our small way, helped a little. Who knows? It was all down, 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 gradually, ruin and levelling and disappearance. Then it was all up, 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 gradually, as seeds grew to saplings, and saplings to forest trees, and bramble and fern came creeping in to help. Leaf mould rose and obliterated, Streams in their winter freshet brought sand and soil to clog and to cover, and in course of time our home was ready for us again, and we moved in. Up above us, on the surface, the same thing happened. Animals arrived, liked the look of the place, took up their quarters, settled down, spread and flourished. They didn't bother themselves about the past, they never do. They're too busy. The place was a bit bumpy and hillocky, naturally, and full of holes, but that was rather an advantage. And they don't bother about the future either. The future when perhaps the people will move in again, for a time, as may very well be. The wildwood is pretty well populated by now, with all the usual lot, good, bad and indifferent. I name no names. It takes all sorts to make a world, but I fancy you know something about them yourself by this time. I do indeed, said the mole with a slight shiver. Well, well, said the badger, patting him on the shoulder. It was your first experience of them, you see, and we must all live and let live. But I'll pass the word around tomorrow, and I think you'll have no further trouble. Any friend of mine walks where he likes in this country, or I'll know the reason why. When they got back to the kitchen again, they found the rat walking up and down, very restless. The underground atmosphere was oppressing him and getting on his nerves, and he seemed really to be afraid that the river would run away if he wasn't there to look after it. So he had his overcoat on, and his pistols thrust into his belt again. Come along, Mole, he said anxiously, as soon as he caught sight of them. We must get off while it's daylight. Don't want to spend another night in the wild wood again. It'll be all right, my fine fellow, said the otter. I'm coming along with you, and I know every path blindfold. 
and if there's a head that needs to be punched, you can confidently rely upon me to punch it. You really needn't fret, Ratty, added the badger placidly. My passages run further than you think, and I've bolt holes to the edge of the wood in several directions, though I don't care for everybody to know about them. When you really have to go, you shall leave by one of my shortcuts. Meantime, make yourself easy and sit down again. The rat was nevertheless still anxious to be off and attend to his river, so the badger, taking up his lantern again, led the way along a damp and airless tunnel that wound and dipped, part vaulted, part hewn through solid rock, for a weary distance that seemed to be miles. At last, daylight began to show itself confusedly through tangled growth overhanging the mouth of the passage, and the badger, bidding them a hasty goodbye, pushed them hurriedly through the opening, made everything look as natural as possible again, with creepers, brushwood, and dead leaves, and retreated. They found themselves standing on the very edge of the wildwood, rocks and brambles and tree roots behind them, confusedly heaped and tangled. In front, a great space of quiet fields, hemmed by lines of hedges black on the snow, and far ahead, a glint of the familiar old river, while the wintry sun hung red and low on the horizon. The otter, as knowing all the paths, took charge of the party, and they trailed out on a beeline for a distant stile. Pausing there a moment and looking back, they saw the whole mass of the wildwood, dense, menacing, compact, grimly set in vast white surroundings. Simultaneously, they turned and made swiftly for home, for firelight and the familiar things it played on, for the voice sounding cheerily outside their window of the river that they knew and trusted in all its moods that never made them afraid with any amazement. As he hurried along, eagerly anticipating the moment when he would be at home again among the things he knew and liked, the mole saw clearly that he was an animal of tilled field and hedgerow, linked to the ploughed furrow, the frequented pasture, the lane of evening lingerings, the cultivated garden plot. For others, the asperities, the stubborn endurance, or the clash of actual conflict that went with nature in the rough. He must be wise, must keep to the pleasant places in which his lines were laid, and which held adventure enough in their way to last for a lifetime. The end.